Today, we're going on a trip. In 1990s, VR was still a pixelated dream. And the metaverse was, well, just a conversation starter at tech parties. But we've come a long way since then. Just look at how we progressed in 30 years' time. In 1995, we had heavy, tethered headsets that weighed over 10 pounds. Tony Parisi co-developed the first virtual reality modeling language, AK Vermal. And Tony also wrote several books on XR and was the head of ARVR at Unity Technologies. Most recently, he was the chief strategy officer at Lamina One, the company founded by Neil Stevenson, who wrote the VR Bible, Snow Crash. So whether you're an XR enthusiast, a tech wizard, or just curious about what's happening in the virtual universe, this podcast is your one-way ticket to XR enlightenment with a side of Tony's signature charisma. Friends, here's Tony Parisi. Hey, Tony, what's going on? Hey, David GM. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, man. Uh, thanks so much for you know offering to do this podcast. My pleasure. We haven't done a VR report in a, a year or two. How long has it been? It's been at least five, <laughs> five years, or six, six years. years. Yeah. <laughs> this is fun. I'm glad to get back in the saddle with you, man. Awesome. Are you enjoying your summer? What have you been up to? Oh, yeah. Totally enjoying it. Right now, I'm in New England, uh, southern New Hampshire with my in-laws. They have a place on a lake, and it's just beautiful. And I have to get out of San Francisco in the summertime. You know all about it. It's uh, the Mark Twain quote, right? It's the coldest summer ever so I, I told my wife marina a little while ago uh we were in the fog it was like you know late july and it was 58 degrees and foggy and i said this isn't summer you got to get me out of here so then we booked a plane and uh, we're here in new england my family's also in new england uh, in massachusetts and we're gonna go see them tomorrow you know we never talked about this but how, did you grow up in new england yeah, actually, I was born outside of Boston, a town called Gloucester, Mass., which is uh, maybe somewhat well-known. It's a fishing town about 40 minutes north of Boston, where the um, film A Perfect Storm was filmed. Hmm. Uh, my cousin's fishing boat was actually used in the film. So I have a bunch wow. of, uh, on my dad's side, a bunch of Sicilian fishermen. Hmm. And his boat was... Uh, Used. It wasn't the one they destroyed in the big storm. That was all CG or physical effects or whatever. But it was the one docked in the harbor in Gloucester. Uh, my cousin Chuck's boat. <laughs> That's wild. And then we moved from there um, to southern Vermont, actually. Well, we moved around. My dad was a music teacher. So he moved from uh, between a couple of teaching jobs. And we finally settled in southern Vermont in this rural place, a gorgeous place in the country where I grew up until I went to college. That makes a lot of sense regarding your musical background. So your father was a music teacher. Like, did he right. did he play like teach everything or anything specific? Well, he, he was he played piano and trumpet himself. He was a band leader. He taught in grammar schools and high schools, and he was a live performer. He played uh, piano. He's a really great pianist. He's, he's passed on, so I'm speaking about him in the past tense. Hmm. Um, and he had a jazz band in the wherever he was. He would always have a jazz combo. And in fact. Around the age of 13, back when they let you do this, I would gig in the nightclubs with him. I played drums. He got me. So I was playing piano when I was a little kid. So I grew up in a, you know, with music my whole life. So I, was, I played piano as soon as I could walk. Um, tried other instruments, played trumpet and band for a while. And then my dad got me a drum kit at 12. Like he was like, hey, you know, I found an ad in the newspaper. And we went down, we looked at this drum set. We brought it and we set it up in my living room. And my mother never got him another moment's peace. Until I moved out of the house because I played drums to like prog rock and hard rock and just like bashing on these drums when I wasn't playing drums in my dad's swing band. And we'd rehearse in the living room. We'd need to get like eight other people jammed into our living room, brass, you know, clarinet and everything, bass, stand up bass. And then a quartet of those people would go and gig at nightclubs, local restaurants and nightclubs. And they would let a teenager do that back then. Now the alcohol police would not let that happen, right? <laughs> yeah, wow, so I grew up like... playing music in rural Vermont. Wow, that makes total sense now, considering your background, and your, your love and affinity as a musician and as someone leading uh, one of the early pioneers of the XR you know, landscape itself. Um, did, did music actually influence you to get into tech? You know, I don't think it's that kind of a straight line. It's funny. I was actually really good at math as well. I was like the kind of star math student at uh, my high school. And then I went to music school first for a couple of years, Berklee College of Music in Boston. But then the realization, because I love music so much, I thought that's what I was going to do for a career. But then finally kind of did the math, so to speak, 
the realization that this is a really rough career to be in unless you happen to get super, super lucky and become a big pop star. Um, so I decided to go get a real job, if you will, and a real degree. And what I was good at was math. And they were having computer science classes already in my high school. And by the time I got to college, that was a fully established, uh, you know, craft and and curriculum. And so I took computer science classes at U UMass, University of Massachusetts, where I ended up getting a CS degree. Um, so along the way in that journey, I was super inspired by computer graphics, namely Princess Leia being about this tall on the tabletop in the original Star Wars movie. So I was a little kid, and this image was in the back of my mind the whole time. So I took some courses and that kind of stuff, but I didn't really actually figure out 3D graphics until I was on the job in one of my first uh, software jobs. And I had an opportunity to work in some 3D graphics piece of our product. And it all kind of finally came together. So it's, it's, it wasn't really a linear influence on the music side, but I never stopped doing music either. So, and, and it turns out, and you may have experienced this as well, you probably know a lot of folks who are computer software engineers or product people or somewhere in the software industry or even hardware that have a deep musical background. There's some affinity there between the way your brain works with music and the way your brain works with creating computer technology. And I'm not sure what it is. There's some part of the brain though, I think that is you know, definitely overlapping there. So I'm certainly not the only person I know who's good at both crafts, you know, so whatever that's worth. And, but it is definitely, I think the musician side has always kind of tipped me toward being more of a creative thinker when it comes to approaching software problems. I don't approach these things as an engineer as much as a creator. Oh, problem, go build something versus like, let's go analyze it and pick it apart and do all the math. That's, you know, like I said, I was good at the math, but at some point I got tired of the math and so it doesn't excite <laughs> me anymore. Yeah, I think mathematical concepts um, have a lot to do with musical understanding. So I think there's definitely a, a tie in there. And then tell me about your career in terms of the early days, because you were such a pivotal, um, you played such a pivotal role in VRML and the early days of 3D graphics standards like X3D. Um, walk me through how that even came about. Yeah, so I was uh, still, I was working in high tech jobs in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So we had Boston uh, neighboring town where all the high tech is that's close to town. There's a whole strip of high tech a little bit north of Boston as well. Uh, so I was in the tech industry there, and my new wife, Marina, and I uh, decided we needed to get out of Boston. She grew up there. I grew up in New England. Go west, young man, a young lady. And we decided <laughs> we were just going to get in a minivan, pack all our stuff up, and drive across. And that's what we did. Uh, I was telecommuting for one of the companies I was working at. It was you know early internet days. I was able to get on and tell net and FTP files and do all the things you could do with a dial-up modem in the mid-90s. Uh, and... Arriving there in San Francisco, which is where we landed, we looked up this guy, Mark Pesci, that we had met in Boston, because he's also a New Englander. He's like seven days younger than me and was born 20 miles from where I was born. So he was born in Revere. I was born in Gloucester, very close. And um, we had just so much that we connected on. And he had told me he'd been working in virtual reality. At the time, he had a virtual reality hardware startup that totally tanked. People were trying to do, David, I think you know this. People were trying to do commercial VR, consumer grade, you know, on small kind of format devices like what we now know as the Oculus Quest or, you know, the, the PSVR. Back in the early 1990s, there was a whole tech boom around virtual reality that even predates the Internet boom by about five years. Um, it did not go well because the tech really wasn't ready. The hardware wasn't cheap enough. You were really getting motion sick. Things weren't rendering fast enough. All those tech problems that have mostly been broken through now in modern VR. People were trying to do that 30 years ago, wildly, right? And more than 30 years ago. So Mark had a crashed startup from that. He kind of licked his wounds. He was thinking about what's next. And along comes the Mosaic web browser in 1992, 1993. And he starts cooking up this idea for doing 3D in a web browser. And he, and, uh, he told me about this project and we worked on a prototype together and he and I coded it together. So I thought, no, oh, that's a great idea. It's wacky. It's never going to work. But I just wanted to try it because it sounded like a fun uh, tech thing to solve. And by then you could actually do real time 3D graphics on a desktop computer. Laptops weren't fast enough. And, you know, the portable computers of the day were still giant, you know, ovens like <laughs> easy bake ovens. They weren't today's laptop. 
And we certainly didn't have mobile phones then, but it was looking like it was feasible. And so over a slow dial-up inter internet connection, we delivered 3D models you could click on, it would connect to worldwide web pages and go back and forth between a web browser and a 3D viewer. And then we took that to the first ever World Wide Web conference in 1994 and presented it. And that came to be known as something as VRML. The industry rallied around that. We're like, we're going to be 3D on the internet. We're building Neil Stevenson's metaverse. The, the novel Snow Crash had come out in 1992, inspiring a lot of geeks. And Neuromancer by William Gibson a few years before that, inspiring a lot of geeks to build this 3D internet that we're all talking about again today, years later. Um, and so that became a huge, huge boom. Dozens of the top tech companies, Silicon Graphics was instrumental in uh, contributing technology. The new web browser company, Netscape, which is now the, you know, the Firefox browser two and a half decades later. Um, Apple, Oracle, Sun. I mean, every giant in technology was doing something there, IBM. And we built up all this tech. We built 3D standards, VRML, and then another one called X3D, which was sort of a successor to it. And that all crashed and burned in the late 1990s uh, for lack of commercial adoption, because even though the tech was really cool and starting to work, then the use cases and the creators who could actually do anything with it and the tools for it were not really there. And most people were spending their time on the internet just building web pages, just 2D web pages, nothing with avatars, nothing with streaming media yet. It was still like super early. So it was definitely, while it was a technological marvel, if I do say so myself, I mean, I'm not the only one building that. There were dozens of us contributing on the technology side. Uh, it was absolutely commercially the wrong time to do that. And the things that we learned from that are still being brought to bear now, years later, when we have the computing power to do all that. And so, yeah, that's wild. And in, in the interim, you asked about this, I think. I worked on one more uh, 3D standard that has had a lot of success, uh, GLTF. So just around 11 years ago, maybe it was 12, people started working on, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot with WebGL, 3D rendering in a browser. That was starting to be everywhere. It was in Chrome, it, 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 you know, Safari. It's in every browser now. You can render 3D with JavaScript. People figured that out from the browser side, all the deep geeks who were working on the APIs and all the tech in your browser. And yet nobody had a way to deliver 3D models. If, if you wanted to do it, you had to write the entire graphics pipeline yourself, take it out of a tool like Blender or Maya, write the converters, and then you'd write your own format that was, you know, in some kind of text or binary format that you'd just send over the internet. And so people got together, including myself, and said, all right, I guess it's time to revisit this VRML part of it, which is what is the HTML-like language that people can use to, you know, create content that can run everywhere in a mobile browser and in a web page. And that became GLTF, and it's been wildly successful. It's, it's so successful that it's the 3D format you can put models into PowerPoint with, um, Instagram, you know, filters and snap lenses use it under the covers for their 3D content. You can import the 3D models into the, those tools from Meta and from Snap. And it's the 3D file format people use for NFTs and Bitcoin ordinals now too. So all the 3D models that are on blockchain are in GLTF. Um, Apple's launched their own version of a format. That's another discussion, but it's sort of like their quick time equivalent. They always like to do their own thing as well. But GLTF is the ubiquitous one. And so finally, you know, the VRML idea has succeeded through a format called GLTF. And I was one of the original authors of that. So I finally got that job done and out of the way. And I'm pretty proud of that. And so, yeah, in this, these nearly 30 years of working on 3D, I have uh, created a few of these file formats now. And they're kind of key, I think, to the, the success of adoption of 3D as a media type, uh, which is something I'm sure you want to talk about. But, you know, and it's it's... It's this one little specialized part of building the entire metaverse, but I think it's kind of a foundation, foundational one. <clears throat> you know, with your, your vast experience in the XR industry, you've witnessed a huge evolution of just the idea of metaverse and that concept itself. What excites you most now? Oh, well, first, give me your definition now that you gave him, given a lot of history to a lot of our audience, but what about its potential? And what's your definition of, of the metaverse concept? I know there's two things there. Yeah, well, I mean, the potential is huge, which is why people are so excited about it. I think the idea of digital twins of everything in the real world being captured and being able to be shared online for use in design collaboration, tourism. I mean, you, you know, the 
the, the use cases are legion for like physical objects being represented online, right? Um, and then, you know, take the flip side of that, the fantastical, the video game kind of technology where we can build anything we couldn't do in the physical world, anything you can possibly imagine. But for use cases like just getting together, socializing, hanging out, uh, listening to music together in a virtual world where everyone's got some kind of fun avatar representation, those are incredibly compelling. Um, we're now at a place where the technology is cheap enough and easy enough to build the content with that you don't need a game development budget to create a virtual world. You don't need to take 18 months to 36 months to build a video game title. David, you're from this industry too. You know how much it takes to build like a triple A title, right? We're not talking about triple A titles. We're talking about you or me, who's not actually a professional 3D creator, going into some simple tool, grabbing a template like WordPress, um, saying, I wanna put my stuff here, here and there. This is my personal space. I'm gonna let 10 of my friends in. They all get an invite online and boom, they pop in. Maybe they've already created an avatar and that, that was done with an easy tool too. So it's getting to the level of like a WordPress meets a, you know, meta, you know, Facebook kind of, you know, application. And we're really very nearly there. So that part super excites me. Um, I wrote a screed, a treatise, an essay at the end of 2021 after everyone was going crazy about the metaverse again because Mark Zuckerberg said metaverse and he renamed his company Meta. Um, so many people started crawling out of the woodwork saying they were experts in the metaverse. They, they started new consultancies. All of a sudden there's 50 book titles you're seeing pre-sales for, everyone's an expert on it. And they're all saying this stuff online that is like dead wrong or just semi right or misguided in my opinion. And I kind of was trying to breathe through it. I just like was trying to just like chill out, be like, okay, let the let the kids have their day and take over and figure it out. But at some point, I could not keep silent, and I started firing tweets off into the Twitterverse, like rule number one. <laughs> and I just started it as kind of a you know, almost like a Bill Maher new rules kind of thing, right? It's <laughs> like rule. Um, and then people started retweeting those, and then people started actually stealing them and putting them in PowerPoint decks. <laughs> Yeah, and I was I like, that. I guess I better actually write something beyond these seven tweets I'd written. So I turned that into an essay called The Seven Rules of the Metaverse, in which I really don't say what the metaverse is, but I try to frame it in such a way that we, we put it on rails and say, this is what it's not. Because so many people were like trying to grab land around it, like big tech companies and say, well, the metaverse has to be a giant, I don't know, NVIDIA cloud server that renders your stuff. Love NVIDIA, they're doing amazing stuff. <laughs> like, don't don't get me wrong, but it's not that. Or that everything's gonna be in a VR headset. Or everybody has to have an avatar for everything they do, when maybe we just wanna communicate in 3D because we wanna look at the same 3D model of a new product we're building and annotate it. We didn't need little cartoon bodies walking around the thing. Well, it depends on what it is, right? If it's a long you wanna see how it drives around, maybe, you know, riding the you put your butt on there, but otherwise, no, right? Like you didn't need a person in there. So, you know, everyone was coming at it from like one tiny little sliver of it and saying, well, it's obviously about getting into a virtual world and chatting. No, it's 3D plus the internet. That's my sort of, you know, very expansive definition of this stuff. Doesn't matter what uh, piece of hardware you're on. It doesn't matter what the use case is. It's definitely not just all about gaming. That's another common misconception. Definitely not gonna be controlled by one big company. Even if they try, you can't control, or this, this is too big. This is, you know, tr multi-trillion dollar enterprise, industry, academia, everything, every human endeavor is gonna be in the metaverse the way it's on the internet now. Um, so I'm starting to think I know what it is. I'm starting to uh, kind of micro blog about that online in long form tweets right now. A couple of years ago, I said, you know, this, I'm not going to say what it is, but I'm going to try and give you these rails about what it's not in this article, The Seven Rules. But now I think I know what it is, and I'm going to be talking about that soon. So I would say, David, you're going to have to watch the space. I'm going to just tease you with that and say, that's awesome. I'm not going to give it up. Immensely. Yeah, but I, I feel like <laughs> I, I will say I feel like we're in it already. and It's already here. And beyond that, I, I'm going to, you know, leave it to um X, the everything app where I do my posting these days and maybe on Medium on my blog. That's awesome. I can't wait. I think um, you touched on a couple of things. Now that, you know, VR is accessible for, for developers, 
Um, we still lack the content. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but Medal, uh, Medal of Honor, EA's big um, World War II military shooter that they published for MetaQuest. Their multiplayer features is probably the only reason why I play the game. Um, the, the quality and the polish is also there too. Uh, but that's a triple A game, or at least built by a triple A publisher. It probably doesn't have as many people uh, who, who are building Madden, for example. But they have a, a super robust team. It was a super big production. But they just announced recently that they're canceling multiplayer, which I th thought was like a misstep, considering the metaverse is all about being social right. and meeting other people. So, and it's it's also interesting that if you look at the top, you know, twenty rated highest rated games on the Meta Store today. None of them are AAA, what we call AAA gaming projects. They're, they're you know, smaller projects like, you know, uh, Puzzling Places uh, or, or even Moss. Um, these really story-driven or mechanics that really leverage VR, right? Um, now that Apple's now into the mix, and of course, they're going to also woo and attract big publishers. What do you think about the Apple Vision Pro? And what does that mean for developers today who are, who've been developing for VR? What are your thoughts on that? So let me let me unpack. There's really two things that in, interconnect there that you talked about. And the first is where we're at with the Quest and the current set of VR headsets. I think at the end of the day, you know, it's still a bit of a mismatch between the number of headsets that are out there um, and the giant budgets of the largest AAA studios, which is probably one of the reasons you're seeing still bigger success in the mid-level indie titles. Um, and that may also relate to the multiplayer question of just multiplayer infrastructure is expensive and all that. So I don't think, I mean, where are we at now? Maybe, have you seen the latest stats, David? I have not been tracking them because I've been in a completely other place in my you know, creative pursuits lately. Sure. But are we still in the sort of 10 to 20 million deployed headsets out there really? I mean, it, I think it's that's- over the, 20 million now it's for, over 20 for just million. meta, right? And that the sun- That's including, great. Yeah. That's great, but that's still like half of the size of the install base of PlayStation uh, or the consoles, and it's still way smaller than anything you can do on PC gaming, right? That's right. In the billions now, right? Or a billion, um, or hundreds of millions at least. So, I mean, what's the size of Roblox? It's that population is like 300 million, right? Or Fortnite mm -hmm. or something. Um, so, we're still in order of magnitude away. So, there's a real mismatch again in the investments a big studio would make and be able to recoup. So, I think that's why we're seeing a lot of that. But I think it's also interesting that you bring into this conversation because I see them as connected, the Apple Vision Pro. I mean, one of the things that I intended to go off about in one of my highly opinionated blog posts, but I have not written this one yet, but I'm happy to share it here, is that when, when you look at what got so many of us, you and me, and it's so many folks into XR, you know, eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, again, with the resurgence of these platforms like the uh, Oculus Rift, and then the HTC Vive was the potential for this to be used in so many applications beyond gaming. We were thinking about this as the next computing platform. But when you look at what Meta has done, everything they've done has really been about gaming. Palmer Lucky, the founder, he built his headsets for, as gaming devices. Mm -hmm. The DNA of the exec team of Oculus, mostly gaming. Though you know, Brendan and uh, Michael were more like- Autodesk. Yeah, they were Autodesk and design, but it was really kind of gaming driven still. Mm -hmm. And when it was brought into Facebook, now Meta, it was Jason Rubin running content, gaming guy. A lot of gaming in the DNA. Meta comes in, tries to graft social onto the top of it for obvious reasons. Nowhere in, in there is this, you know, executive level strategic mandate to make this a next computing platform. They talk about it, but it's more like social meets gaming missing an entire universe of other applications. Meanwhile, Apple is quietly doing stuff for how long? Probably a decade on this hardware. Not saying a thing, like not a peep coming out of anywhere out of Cupertino. They're not allowed to. And then to. boom, here comes, right, that's Apple. <laughs> then here comes the Vision Pro. And what do they say? They don't say anything about gaming. They're not saying VR. It is a spatial computing device. It is the next computing platform. It is the thing that so many of us were hoping it was going to be when it was, you know, Oculus and Vive. So I think there's a big kind of just complete strategic blind spot that happened over in Meta that from a personal standpoint, and this is why I brought you know, us into it, 
has disappointed a lot of creators, they're, they're psychologists, educators, enterprise computing people who could never get enough first class support out of Facebook at the time with their business programs. The list goes on. Now, that's not to say like the Quest is a great gaming device. Maybe it's actually the next, you know, Game Boy, the next console, you know, and that's cool. That's up on your face. It's a little weird, but, you know, people seem to like that, right? Uh, I may be just a little old to enjoy that at this point. But, you know, Apple's thinking about it differently. It's augmented reality. It's spatial computing. It's more like what Magic Leap was trying to do. Um, and so I see the potential of this is amazing. I think we'll see the prices come down. Obviously, it's going to be a Lux device at $3,500 going to be limited supply. I hope I can get my hands on one. I don't have an inside track anywhere. And um, I think it's if it does well, we'll see two more generations and then it will be iPhone prices. I mean, that might take the rest of this decade. I guess I'm guessing it probably will. But the potential is incredible. Um, I certainly, you know, I, I, I love being immersed in 3D. I love 3D graphics. The idea that you'd be completely closed off for hours a day has never sat well with me. Um, for fully immersive experiences, fabulous. But if this is going to really work, I mean, for me, if this is going to really work, you don't have anything on your face, but I think that, you know, this is back to Princess Leia, right? <laughs> but I think we're talking probably 20 years for that. Who knows? I don't even know what that's going to take. There's optics and materials engineering and God knows what. Um, I'm not a hardware person, a software guy. You know? So I, I love it all because it's all more 3D graphics whether it's on a flat screen like we're looking at today and just, you know, rendered onto that flat screen or stereo fully immersive VR or these other optical tricks we have with uh, mixed reality. That's what excites me about it. Um, and the potential of all these other applications, which gets us back to the metaverse. It's not about any one use case. Um, it's about communicating, you know, doing commerce, creating together. It's all those things, right? And I think we're well on the way. I mean, we're in, the, we're in the birth cycle of that metaverse tech. Since around that moment, I mean, Zuckerberg saying the M word, that was helpful because that unleashed <laughs> investment. I mean, it was followed immediately by, you know, just generally tech markets tanking and everything. So we had a little bit of a bump in the road. But when this comes back on, you bet it's going to be all metaverse -y stuff again. And then, you know, where that intersects with the blockchain, which I'm very, very, you know, steeped in now and have been for the last couple of years becomes real and and you know the third component ai and what this is going to mean for creation this is going to be a really interesting time in computing i have no crystal ball about what that device is we're all going to be enjoying this with or with these one or two devices that we're going to be enjoying this through uh, you know seven years from now no idea I'm, I'm looking to be super surprised by that but i guarantee you most of the media will be interacting with will be 3d i couldn't agree more i think we're at a really pivotal time in terms of the XR industry where the cost of the bomb cost or the cost of goods of actually creating the hardware has gone down tremendously. Um, Immersed is, is, a, is a VR software that allows you to collaborate and have multiple monitors. They just rec recently announced uh, a headset. So I think there's going to be also these different app makers who may have not been into gaming, but focused on enterprise or medical use cases. They might even be releasing their own headsets, considering that the hardware cost is, is now a little bit more accessible. Can you elaborate um, on your vision of the convergence of XR and blockchain and AI? My personal take is that the metaverse will never happen because nobody wants to be renters their whole life. Just like in the real world, people want to own the things that they're spending a lot of time with and investing in. And to, in order to be able to own things in the metaverse, we have to have things like blockchain. Um, and also in terms of AI, you've heard this, AI uh, is really the conduit for XR to explode because XR is really the portal for AI or at least the input for AI. You at Lamina, let's, let's first, let me take a step back. Please describe your role working with Lamina. You mentioned Neil Stevenson's before, so I'd like to get some of my listeners who, who may be new to this world to understand that and then help people understand the crossovers between XR and blockchain and AI. Great. Okay. We'll take uh, blockchain first. And then if I ramble too hard, put me back on track about AI because <laughs> I could go on about blockchain for a while. Yeah, so uh, Lamina that you mentioned, there's a company, uh, Lamina One. Until very recently, I was chief product officer there. It was founded by Neil Stevenson. He 
coined the term metaverse in his 1992 novel, Snow Crash. <clears throat> and Neil co-founded Lamina One with Peter Vesinus, who's a blockchain originalist, like early Bitcoiner, um, very deep geek on math and all kinds of technical proofs and things that required cryptography uh, for blockchain tech. And he had been inspired by Neil as well on the crypto side, because Neil also wrote a novel called Cryptonomicon, which, and he wrote other novels, The Diamond Age, which predicted digital money years and years ago. And so a lot of people were influenced by Neil's work so much so that we're kind of living in his world. It's not playing out the way it did in Snow Crash or Cryptonomicon or Diamond Age, but these things are actually happening and they are driving forces in the technology spheres we operate in today. So cryptocurrency and blockchain tech confer a couple of things. They create global financial systems without, and, and, and this is relevant to gaming and, and digital goods that we'll talk about in a second. And they create the ability to create digital assets with blockchains like Ethereum, at least, and now Bitcoin's getting into the game as well. You can have programmable digital objects that represent you know, assets like, you know, bitmap art, people say, oh, you can just copy the bitmap. What you can't copy is the ownership deed to the bitmap. And that's what an NFT is. So you have financialization and ownership in a global uh, infrastructure that nobody controls. So it's not, for example, if you wanted to do this in gaming prior to blockchain and you wanted to have a digital currency in there, there have been plenty of digital currencies like in World of Warcraft and any free to play game on mobile but they were always specific to that one game. You couldn't get your goods out of that one game, putting them, put them into another game. You can't take your money out of that game easily, right? You have to convert it back if, you, if they let you into fiat currency and then turn it into a different currency for another game. With these newer things with, you know, with crypto, you now have digital money that will transfer between games or applications in any way you want. So the Ethereum I use to buy an NFT is the same Ethereum I use if I wanted to send you a payment for a good or service. Um, so that is significantly different and is absolutely required for the open metaverse so that you don't have one or two parties controlling the financial system around that. Uh, you don't have a proprietary format the digital goods are in. So in theory, an NFT I buy from a musician that has artwork could be a ticket into a world in the metaverse that somebody else decides, oh, you're a holder of Violetta's music? You have a free entry pass into this virtual world I just created. And they don't have to write giant gobs of code. I mean, it's like, you know, a lot of page of code. They don't have to write like a whole new system to make that happen. All of these pieces of technology already interoperate. So you have foundational digital money and digital assets that can be used anywhere in any world. Why is that important? Beyond not being locked into like one person system, it creates a way for independent small creators to thrive. And we're seeing this with music and NFTs. We're seeing this with visual art and NFTs. We're seeing it with these board Ape style collections as well. But I, I have many issues with those. I mean, most of those are like highly speculative projects and end up being ripoffs. We've seen it. And that's why a lot of those, what we call PFP projects, you know, they boom and bust. And they're going, a bunch of them are going through a crash cycle right now. But if you look at the ones that are closer to digital identity, to true artwork and creation like music and, and um, visual art, whether it's paint, painting or 3D, um, they are holding their value and they again will have a longer lasting value because it's as if you've got a rare album you collected from some music artist it's as if you owned an original you know miro or picasso and you know the market value of that may be you know 10 20 years down the line but they're going to have worth over time as we as we vaporize more stuff we have in the real world and put more stuff in digitally so i see those as fundamental for independent creators in the metaverse and as we've seen in xr most of the ways that creators have monetized outside these successful gaming projects on the quest um, has been they, they've basically cost money they have not made money they've been supported by google or microsoft or someone trying to get their hardware out there and they're spending their marketing budget on it and that some content creator takes this app to a festival and that's how you get it seen but it never succeeds commercially because they didn't really have any way to monetize in goods or or they're you know trapped in a sorry but they're trapped in a quest marketplace which is taking half their revenue with open metaverse where you're not inside a closed ecosystem the creators can keep 90 percent of that revenue 98 percent you're playing a mark you're paying a marketplace fee to say open sea and they're taking a tiny percentage right so it's fundamentally different it gives xr and metaverse creators an economic infrastructure to play and they've never had before and so you don't you can be a one-person shop 
and really succeed the way a one person mobile mobile development shop has been able to in the past. You're no longer stuck in this tiny um, closed ecosystem, though mobile may be a bad analogy because it's a du duopoly with Apple and Google. But at least the cre cost to create and distribute are reasonable. Um, and then the marketplace fees there are reasonable. They're 30% less, right? Um, but they're going down on blockchain. Like I said, they're getting down to single digit percents, which is huge. Or, you know, what Epic's trying to do with, with uh, their marketplace stuff is 12%. So it's moving in the right direction where creators get to keep most of the bounty of what they're making. And then that's the way it should be. They, the technology should be a piece of the supply chain. Right? It should be the widgets that help you experience this stuff. Not They should not control the user's life and the creator's life the way you know, Web2 social networks have or big, you know, big e-com uh, portals, right? So it's a really exciting time. And so the, the spatial tech connected to the blockchain and, and crypto technology create this really beautiful green field for independent creators. That's why I'm excited about it. I, I totally agree. And now that we have generative AI, I mean, we, we've been friends for a long time. This was, it, it, we should be talking about life after gen AI. How do you think AI is going to affect XR in, in the coming future? Well, okay, and this is where it's probably a function of my age, and this is going to sound a little bit get off my lawn. But before I get to the good stuff with AI, I got to talk about my concerns about it. Uh, I have a small concern and a big concern. The small concern is there is no doubt it's already happening. It's putting lower tier creatives out of work. Uh, things that I can do now by prompting Mid Journey or ChatGPT, but Mid Journey in particular. Um, you know, you know, junior creators, I would pay before to do concept art or even, you know, the final delivery art for depending on what I'm doing. Now, obviously, if I'm doing a really art intensive project and I wanted to do something with a fine artist, I would still employ a fine artist like my wife, Marina, who's partnered with me on my current NFT drop. She's doing all this beautiful artwork. She is not using any AI tools right now. She will be using some AI tools in the course of the rest of this project to accelerate her work or create variations of what she's already done, but she is still the creative director in charge of that project. But junior creatives who had a job doing, you know, sort of piece work are now, you know, going to be challenged to find work, I think. And that's not a great situation. So it's deeply concerning. It's going to put artists, screenwriters, you know, with ChatGPT and other you know, types of writing journalists out of business if we're not mindful of that. And it needs to be guided very ethically there. I mean, some of that's the cost of progress. I'm not a lot of <laughs> but I am, I am getting old and wizened about some of this stuff. Uh, the big concern I have about AI is what happens after generative AI, which is what you're asking about. Silicon Valley has no morals, money people in Silicon Valley, and they're gonna fund the Terminator. But we don't know where it's gonna come from yet, but all, <laughs> all this work that's going into AI is going to create death robots that are gonna enslave and destroy us all. We've seen the movie before, social networking nearly destroyed civilization. It's created great rifts. We thought it was going to bring us all together. It did. It also threatens to tear us apart. This is the Sorcerer's Apprentice thing all over again with AI. We don't know what we're going to unleash, um, and I'm terrified of it. And I hope it doesn't. what I'm fearing doesn't happen in my time, but it might. So getting that stuff out of the way, I use ChatGPT all the time. I use MidJourney all the time. And I love these tools. They have liberated me. I mean, I'm a great writer, if I do say so myself, but some of the you make are. work out of writing uh, and, and things like just, you know, write me a draft press release for a new thing. It would get me 80% of the way there, and then I go fix it, right? Um, that's what I always used to do with my PR people at all the companies I worked at, actually. <laughs> the PR people would write stuff, and I would go fix it. <laughs> so they may have to worry about their jobs soon, too, uh, the in-house PR folks. But... Um, I would do that with ChatGPT. With MidJourney, it is a lot of concept art uh, for the new studio, Metatron, that I started to launch. I'm actually using it as kind of teaser art and marketing pieces where I would have been paying for that creative before. Again, that's a problem for the creative professionals, but it's great for me. Um, and I could also see, no offense to the my friend Greg, who produced my record that's out now. I'd love to talk about that for a, a hot second anyway. Um, I might be able to do most of that engineering myself with AI assisted tools. You know, the audio engineering part of this to clean things up and make things sound as crisp as possible and all the things that are not in my skill set. Um, but I say that, not the other side of my mouth, I'm really annoyed by people who are tweeting things about how they've never been able to make music before. And 
you know, now they can make music with prompts. And I'm like, dude, put in your thousand hours per instrument like I did, mother effer, because, you know, <laughs> this was real work. You're not just going to walk up there and, and make what Prince can do or what I can do. Like, sorry, no, it's not going to happen. All right. So it's it's fascinating. But I, I love these tools. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned about them, but I think what they can do already for 2D art, the spoken word, you know, written word for now some some early audio stuff that I've heard. Now imagine that for 3D and we're seeing text prompt to 3D world starting to happen. There have been early experiments. Most of them are sort of blocky, like a Matterport scan where it's just a big lump and it's a static, you know, scene with no independent objects. But I think the next gen of those are coming and you're starting to be able to sort of create the shell of the world and then add objects to it simply by saying stuff, right? Typing stuff. And if that's happening now, what's it going to be like in five years? Yeah, you or I, David, with zero 3D modeling skills could just go like, yeah, you know, make me a thing that looks like, uh, you know, this this downtown Target store, here are the photos, and go to town, and boom, I have a full operating 3D world, and connect it up to, uh, you know, Target's commerce-like thing, and boom, I'm, I'm Target's webmaster, and I have an entire virtual world in like a day. And then, you know, have the code team to then clean it up. But seriously, that's the prototype, and it was in a day instead of months. Wild. You're muted, David. I can't hear you. Yeah, totally spot on. I think um, there's companies like Blockade. I don't know if you heard of Blockade Labs, but you're able to use just different prompts to then create um, a stitched together 3D world based on uh, these 2D renderings. And then they, they apply some 3D effect to it, which looks pretty phenomenal. And considering that we're still in the early days and a group of folks had put this together, generative AI and, and being able to generate your environment in 3D, in VR, in real time, wow, that's really the holodeck. Um, and I think that's going to be incredible. And I think with the yeah. advent of game engines, um, you have a lot of understanding and experience with game engines. They've been the driving force for XR development. How do you see the role of game engines evolving XR? I mean, you give a great definition of AI, but how do you see game engines now coming into this mix? Well, so game engines uh, like Unity, and Unreal are awesome. I actually worked at Unity for six years, running VR and AR for them on the business side. And, you know, saw a lot of how people beyond gaming were using the Unity engine. But, you know, as a starting point, what they did and the big innovation that happened with those engines is they allowed a whole new class of folks to become a game creator, starting with gaming, you know, uh, desktop and mobile gaming, right? And before that, most game development happened inside a big company like EA. And you'd have an engine team that would build all the code needed to take the interactive objects and scenes you were thinking about um, delivering to your play game player and rendering them on a screen and handling the mouse input and doing all this like schmutz, all this inner stuff that just takes a lot. And you know, doing it with performance, 30, 60, 90 frames a second. This, you know, basically being able to keep re-rendering the scene in real time. That is all high art. They took those things and put them into toolkits that anyone could use to make games. So you now take it out of the four walls of a big company that controls this entire technology stack and give it to anybody. It's not, but by no means making it as easy as creating web pages. This is the place we need to get to and game engines still aren't good at that. Um, but you could give people with programming skills and art skills a workbench and teams of five to 10 people could build really compelling games for desktop and mobile um, and now VR based on these engine technologies that before would have taken a team 10 times as big. So you can have an independent game shop in the garage, a couple of folks getting started and then scaling that up with art. And you now have a professional looking game title and something that you know behaves well and, and uh, works and works in real time and is really responsive with a small team. That was the innovation that happened. That was about a decade ago where those really, really started blowing up. But the rise of mobile, Unity as a company really started expanding. Uh, both of those companies, Unity and uh, Epic, who makes Unreal Engine, are doing really well just in their core businesses of gaming. Now, beyond that, people have been using this technology in many other applications. Beyond gaming, uh, a lot of it driven by XR, VR and AR. People wanting to build these non-game applications for enterprise, for training, cinematic storytelling that wasn't really a game, a linear game. And they serve those really well too, but you still need highly technical skilled programmers. It's not all drag and drop yet. It's not all template based yet. The kind of metaverse vision I was talking about earlier here, um, where you can just take a template 
drop it in, maybe customize it a little bit and say, Dave's world, everyone come and join. Game Engine still did not do that well. And uh, that's a place I'd like to see them go. Or maybe there's a whole new class of tools that have to come up that are much more about just that, at the WordPress of gaming, if you will, the Wix, Squarespace of gaming. We might see those. Uh, generative AI can connect to that in the sense that the kind of templates that I'm talking about could be created, you know, with a few words, again, with some prompts possibly, and we would see a proliferation of starter worlds or content where you might have started with a canned professionally made template, David, and then you can walk up to the world and say, you know, now put a pink flamingo right in the middle of it, you know, <laughs> a water fountain, pink flamingo water right. fountain, right in the middle of my living room. And it goes, figures it out two seconds later, boom, and the water's flowing and it all just works, right? So that's gonna be an amazing time when that all happens. And under the covers, there's a lot of game engine tech there, but you know, it's kind of game engines, I, I, I'd say are to virtual worlds in the metaverse, the way Photoshop is to web pages on the web today, right? There's a, there's a whole class of creators they cater to that are more on the professional side and we need to get to the more casual, anyone can create scenario. And I don't know if it's the companies of the you know game engine companies that are going to do that or some new players in the industry they'll come along and do that. Yeah, it'll either be incumbents taking out the big boys, but I think the big boys obviously like with Unity they're incorporating uh, you know generative AI to actually help you write code. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of these game engines are going to evolve to take advantage of any new technology. And for sure, my, my take on game engines is that the reason why game engines are, are such a big ponent, proponent for XR is because it allows developers to create very easily what you'll be doing actually in XR experiences, which is being fully immersed. You're probably going to move around. There's movement. There's actual input with actual mechanics of and interacting you can have with lag. Objects. It's got to render fast. The, the, the engines are so good for this stuff. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, you know, from, from a developer standpoint, like you had mentioned, we're not going to have the metaverse without e-commerce and with advertising, you know, outside of just gaming. What are some of the challenges and opportunities with your experience? You have a, a lot of information about this. What are the challenge and, and challenges and opportunities for developers when creating XR experiences that seamlessly integrate with e-commerce and advertising? Yeah, well, the thing is about both e-commerce and advertising, there's a you know speed to development and scale that the game engine tools are not really good at yet, just like we were just talking about that the platforms that XR is delivered in aren't at the scale you'd like other than Snap and Instagram because they've embedded AR in their core applications, right? So if you're trying to deliver these, say, on the web, that's really great. You can use a tool like 8th Wall, which is now Niantic, uh, to do that. But if you're trying to deliver that without using Niantic's tools, um, we're still in a place where web browser support is good, but it's not great. If you want to do it in an app, you have to deliver an app in the app store. Most advertisers don't want to deliver an app, right? Let me, let's talk about advertising. Just We'll get to e-commerce in a second. E-commerce mm -hmm. is a little different. But advertising usually exists to get you to the e-commerce site in the first place. <laughs> it's like I'm advertising so you can buy, me, buy something from me, right? But on the advertising side, what you need it with advertising is scale. So you need to be able to reach someone where they are. And that is either in one of these super apps like Instagram or, you know, Snap uh, or X the everything app if Elon has his way, but mostly it's web, right? And so to be able to deliver the stuff, you need to be able to support web, number one, and you need to have a short creation cycle on the content. And these are both things that haven't quite been solved for AR and definitely not for VR yet. Um, so if I'm an advertiser, I want you to discover a link in an email or in the feed of one of these social apps and then come to my website and have an experience there. And that could be my 3D e-commerce store at that point. But if it's not web-based, then I'm trying to ship an app in an app store and that just takes too long. And the creation cycle again is too long with these tools like Unity. You need drag and drop tools to do that too. So the kind of independent creator stuff I was talking about earlier when it comes to, I just need templates. I need to be able to work fast. I don't have the 3D creation skill. The media or rather the creative side of ad agencies needs those kind of tools. The media side, that is the people who are trying to get in your face and get you to click, need this to happen with just a click, without an app install, without all this other friction, right? So advertising needs those two things. It needs really inexpensive and fast to create media and reach. And XR has not solved either of those yet. We're seeing a lot of good things in the WebXR 
world, you know, browser-based AR, browser-based VR, but it's not uh, at parity feature-wise with things that you can do in a game engine and native code on these XR platforms. And again, it just takes too long because the tools aren't simple enough. And I, I went through a lot of that. Four of my six years at Unity was on the advertising side because Unity has this massive mobile ad platform and we were bringing augmented reality to it. And our clients were going through these two things that were like, we can't have it in an app. <laughs> we need to reach everybody. And we need to be able to make it fast and cheap. You know, the creative budget should be 10 grand, not 200 grand, right? So that's where we're at with that, but it is moving in the right direction. And from what I heard, I believe it's true the Vision Pro from Apple will support all the WebXR specifications. So you should be able to deliver some kind of advertising content into social apps or browser-based things that people are already doing in a Vision Pro. Um, so here's the hope, and in any of these newer XR headsets as well, um, that they would have the web XR spec so that you have web support. And this goes obviously full circle back to what I've been doing 3D on the web forever. Um, you need that lack of friction and the democratization of creation to make that happen. I couldn't agree more. I think that's the right move for Apple to adopt web XR because the internet is not a closed garden. And to be able to have it pro proliferate, people are not going to pay taxes in a closed garden. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of these tech giants know that they understand that, you know, I, I kind of wanted to leave some time with what you're currently working on now regarding music. But before we get into that, um, I also wanted to just have an understanding as a music composer and an artist like yourself, how do you see the integration of audio and music enhancing the immersive quality of XR experiences? Well, first of all, I think every XR experience needs to have audio. You know, we think visually first when we think about these things, most of us, but having a good soundtrack to any game has always been key, whether it's just background music or something that's more fully integrated in the experience. The audio itself is really exciting when it's spatialized, if properly done. So I'm hearing audio sources behind me, in front of me, above me, and we're seeing, you know, uh, Dolby Atmos embedded into, you know, the newer Apple uh, AirPods, right? The AirPods Max Pros. Um, so we're seeing a, a glimpse of that, though that's not dynamic. That's sort of statically created spatialized audio. But at least you can produce audio sources and stream them in for music and other, you know, applications using these new headsets. You know, Bose was trying to make inroads there with some, you know, audio glasses that, you know, are positional with the Bose frames. Yeah, they don't have that product anymore, but they were leaning in pretty hard about that. It's a great speaker company and headphone sounded company. great. Yeah, yeah, they sounded great. It was really amazing having that audio all around you. Um, I know a production company in Amsterdam called Future Phonic, a guy named Richard Berkey, who's doing. The, he's he's dedicated to making this kind of audio. It's like nine one. You've heard of five or nine four. You've heard of five one surround sound. This is nine four. There are speakers up above you. There are speakers everywhere. Uh, you need custom, you know, kind of um, setups for that. But those could be coming into the home. They could definitely be coming into theaters and, you know, small venues. And eventually, I'm sure, would make it also into, you know, more advanced audio. Um, I think that's going to be key. I'm actually going to experiment with some of that spatialized audio, even for just 2D flat vid vid video media to go with my music. Um, and I'm going to work with Richard on, you know, taking the stems from some of my songs and trying to put them in space because it's a theater experience. And so it'd be really great if you were hearing some of the voices come from different places, for example, and you were in the middle of it. How cool would that be? We're going to see how that goes. That's so and, cool. And yeah, so an XR for sure. If you have fully immersive video and audio together, it's, well, yeah. I wanted to leave some time uh, before we wrap up. I know you, you're, thank you for taking the time. I know you're on vacation, but I wanted to leave some time talking about your new NFT project because it's really unique because you took a different stance of really supporting the artist. Yeah, well, so I was, all right, let me back up. I wrote a musical, a full musical, two hours, 21 songs, about the end of the world. It's kind of uh, the Who's Tommy meets the Book of the Revelation, the Christian Book of the Revelation. Boy meets girl, boy gets girl. They fall in love. He loses her because she dies in the, at the end because there's a cosmic battle between good and evil. The forces of good and evil have come this malign force comes to earth, seduces everyone, and, and ultimately enslaves them. Um, so it's, it's a cosmic tale. It's very much based on sort of Christian book of the Revelation ideas uh, and my own coping with my own Christian upbringing. Whole other story. Um, it's a rock musical. I wrote it years ago, finished it up about 15 years ago, and it kind of sat in the can until 
2020, 2019, I started thinking about dusting it off because again, global tensions and everything else, apocalypse, you know, climate change, it's all around us all the time, right? Every generation thinks the world's about to end any minute, right? So I thought I should really dust this off. And I had a friend start shaming me into doing it. Why is this taking you so long? And then during COVID, I recorded all of the demos in my home studio, everything myself. And then after lockdown, I made a record, which is now up on the streaming services. And I released that record just recently. But as I was thinking about releasing it, I realized, okay, I just spent all this money paying a producer, session musicians, professional vocalists. I'm still all over the record, but there's you know, a lot of other people involved now. And now I'm going to have to spend even more money to get people to find it on Spotify or Apple Music. Something is broken here. And at the time, I'd already been, I don't crypto, I'd been buying visual NFTs, and I just started searching online for people making music NFTs uh, to see if they would combine their music with artwork and sell it, sell it this way for real money. Would people pay real money, you know, 10, 20, $100 more for a music piece? And sure enough, people were starting to have successful NFT drops in music. I started collecting some of their music, people I really like, the independent musicians in this world, they were dead set against releasing thing on streaming, things on streaming services. And we all just started talking. And so I've been in this community of independent musicians for a year and a half now. And we're collaborating on some things. We're supporting each other's projects. And so I've released, I've actually released one collection as music NFTs. It wasn't related to my musical. It's a protest song called Cradle to Grave. It's about gun violence and reproductive rights in America, our twin obsessions. And uh, my wife, Marina, did the visual art for it. And it was a small collection. It sold out in two days. You buy my music, you buy Marina's art. $100 a song-ish, $90, like 0.05 Ethereum. People are willing to pay that to support my artistic career. And, you know, support the message and get this collectible artwork that maybe might have some market value someday, assuming my musical career or Marina's art career blows up in Web3 and or both. And then we just released the first drop of the collection from Judgment Day, my musical. So 10 of the 17 songs on the album are going to be sold as NFTs, 100 NFTs at a time. So in total, 1,000 NFTs. And you get collectible art from Marina that's sort of like a tarot deck. There's four elements, four, four suits, uh, numbered cards. They correspond to the number of the song and special symbols and characters, you know, animals and, and uh, objects magical and we're doing magic divinations with them related to the mystical themes in judgment day and it's a way to support this project because the proceeds after i pay myself back my production costs marina gets paid our developer gets paid the remaining money goes to the live production of the musical so we've dropped the first musical on the blockchain and we're using the money to get the live show produced and i've already signed on a production partner for judgment day i can't announce who it is yet there's someone from immersive theater. We're doing radical, innovative theater with it. And when we collect the money from these uh, NFT drops, again, the proceeds are going to go to that company starting to do development because every live show requires development. I mean, it's like I have a vision in my head of what people are doing on stage to every song. I've written the entire book for this whole story. I know how it goes from beginning to end, who the people are, what they're doing. But to get those into a live venue, possibly an immersive theater warehouse where it's multiple things going on at once, possibly in VR or AR, there might be a live metaverse world that goes with this when we launch. That requires prototyping, development, previs, table reads, working with actors, talent, singers. We're going to get that process started, and we're going to take this from the blockchain to Broadway, which is really, I'm super excited about it. And David, you collected, which I really appreciate. And I think, you know, the people who are definitely buying in on this first drop are they got a front row seat to getting this whole thing made. I can't wait. I mean, I've been a supporter just because I'm a big fan of your music. So everyone should check this out. It's, it's something that I can think can revolutionize the music industry. Um, people like Snoop Dogg is really big into NFTs and building the new Death Row records. Uh, he, he set it himself to be, you know, based off of NFT blockchain technology. Yeah. Artists like Tory Lanez. Uh, who recently went to jail, I believe, but he, his album that he sold as an NFT was was doing gangbusters. And um, so I, I think there's a real big future for musicians to go directly to consumers. And that's what I'm 
I'm really excited about telling oh, Of course, I'm big, a big fan of big your music. Big time, dude. But meantime, you can actually experience the music on the streaming services. But as soon That's as we right. sell the NFT collection, I'm taking it down. <laughs> you have to own my NFTs to hear the music uh, or, you know, basically buy a ticket in Web3. Use it, you know, some kind of token gated experience you'd be able to do by, you know, interacting with a smart contract. Boom, you get a ticket. That might be like $10, might not be as expensive. And you hear the music live stream. We're still figuring that out. Yeah, so it's exciting that these tools are being put in the hands of independent creators. And that was one of the reasons I quit the day job a while ago is I felt now is the time the tools are there to enable my career as an independent creator. But I also felt like it was probably time for me to stop talking about the metaverse from the technologist side and talk about it from the side of a creator trying to use these tools to make a living and make the world a better place. And so that's what I'm doing right now. I love it, Tone. Any any parting words? No, that's it. I mean, I don't know. We're we sharing links on the page for the podcast. I'll, or I'll make I... sure. I'll make sure yeah. all of that's uh, embedded. I'm also I'm getting a lot of leverage on TikTok on these short forms, so I'll make sure I include all the links there. Um, I'll ensure. Do I need to get around and shake my booty for the TikTok? You or have is to it dance, a, like... dude. You're oh. gonna have, we're gonna have a little dancing version for you to do that and, and that on YouTube Shorts. Um, no, it's gonna be really fun, and, and I definitely want to carry on the conversation because there's so much that we didn't cover. But uh, thank you so much for your time, Tone. Oh, Dave, my pleasure. Anytime. It's good to be, like I was saying, back in action with you. Uh, it's been too long since I've done a VR report, so let's go. Awesome. Thanks, Tone. Have a great summer. All right. You too, buddy. Talk soon. I'm just going to pause it here.